and just welcome everyone and, and thank you um, for attending and, and also for inviting me to do this presentation. It's really great to have that ability to be able to talk about disaster mental health. Um, I titled it uh, Demystifying Stealth Mental Health. And at the end, I'm going to ask you if you have figured out why we call it stealth mental health. Um, and you should be able to tell me that, I hope. I also want to let you know that in terms of doing this presentation, I researched it by not just looking at DMH um, doctrine and standards and procedures, but I also read the sheltering SP and the job tool for operating a shelter. So, uh, and I found that everything was very consistent with what I've always thought about in terms of DMH in, in shelters. I'm gonna start out by giving you an overview of disaster mental health. And then we're gonna talk in depth about how mental health works in shelters. And I also will do a quick little run through of psychological first aid and how you would be using it in a shelter. So let's start with the mission of disaster mental health. You'll notice that disaster mental health responds both to the emotional needs and the social aspects of, of people who've been affected by disasters. Um, that means that we're gonna look at things like, uh, was their house destroyed? Uh, have they got other issues um, that they've been dealing with, such as maybe they're going through a divorce, are they single mothers, the ages, um, people with pre-existing psychiatric problems. That'll be part of what, um, as disaster mental health, will be interested in. It isn't just sort of, in a sense, if you want to say, psychological. But also notice that we're there not just for the clients or the people affected by the disaster, but also for the workers. And in fact, disaster mental health started in 1992, um, and it was um, there for the uh, workers, not for the clients. And um, it then was uh, later expanded, I believe, around 1999, somewhere or 2000, and became a separate, act, a distinct activity, and began to get involved with um, the clients as well. So um, we've got a long history of working with um, the staff. And when I say staff, I'm talking about volunteers and paid staff. Um, we're hoping in terms of the work that we do in disaster mental health, that we're going to, these early interventions, um, that will, that they will help to either mitigate or, uh, will be, uh, I want to say, is that they, we will not see any long-term consequences. Uh, such as PTSD or depression, those kinds of things. Um, and um, we, our goal, our, our purpose also is to augment the community's mental health resources. We're not there to um, replace them and do them instead of, but rather to help them and give them support. And um, so for the uh, reason I'm saying that is that you may well see in the shelters um, people who are the mental health professionals, such as uh, behavioral health, uh, county or state behavioral health people. You may see in California, we also have what are called FAST teams that sometimes are deployed and work uh, along with us and coordinate with us in the shelters. We also, of course, uh, do work in terms of preparedness, um, in terms of 
uh, participating in exercises, uh, shelter drills, those kinds of things. And in recovery, uh, we do a lot of follow up with particularly with um, folks when they uh, from RC care when they begin to make referrals. And I want to comment that if you have other people showing up in the shelter uh, from the community, you want to make sure the shelter manager will want to make sure that they've been vetted and that they were expected to be there, um, not some people who who just uh, come in and want to help. Um, as you all know, that that happens when we're doing DRs. And we also, by, by the way, uh, occasionally we'll have a, the uh, experience where there's a community managed shelter and they will ask for DMH to come into that shelter because uh, the, the city or county or whoever is managing the shelter does not have those resources. <clears throat> and we do. So as some of our assumptions, as I said earlier, is that we're going to mitigate that distress so there's not some long term. Uh, 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 symptoms or psychological issues. Um, so we we start from the idea that most reactions. That people have are very common and they're expected. And we sometimes you may hear us say things like it's a normal reaction to an abnormal event. Um, and so we want to normalize what our people are going through, that this is common. A lot of times they say to us, oh, you know, I think I'm going crazy. I can't keep track of things, that sort of thing. And we give them a lot of support that this is very common. We also have the assumption that people are very resilient and resiliency is a big byword for um, code in a sense, you could say, for disaster mental health. Um, we really uh, do want to help our folks to recover on their own. We know they can, a lot of people are, res are very resilient, can cope, have the coping skills. There are, however, we know there will be some people who um, they may require some very uh, more significant kind of emotional support uh, during the disaster, after a disaster, and we would make referrals for those folks. So we value our values in, in disaster mental health. Um, all of our, you'll see shortly. I'll talk about eligibility, and our our all of our disaster mental health workers are professionals, and we expect them to work uh, by their code of ethics as a disaster mental health worker. And by the way, they are not there. They are not there to do psychotherapy. Um, We follow the fundamental principles of the Red Cross and the Red Cross and the Red Crescent movement, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And then we value compassion, um, which we uh, compassionate care, collaborative, working together. And you'll see as we talk further about how we need to all collaborate and coordinate our activities in terms of what we're doing for the shelter residents. And in terms of confidentiality, we um, are very clear and very careful around not sharing information unless we have permission from a client. So you may sometimes ask us to talk with someone or you're very concerned about them. And then the mental health worker comes back and says, well, I've talked to them, but doesn't give you any further information. That's the only time we would do it. It also is if it was um, needed as part of our work together with the clients. So who's eligible to be a disaster 
mental health worker. Uh, Diane had talked last week about uh, our eligibility standards. And as I said, they're all professionals, have a master's degree, and then some kind of, of a license or registration. And please note that we do take mental health professionals who have a retired license or they have an out of state. That was a, ch a, a big change that we made in 2017. And I'm saying that because if you have friends or, or know people who are mental health professionals, um, please, and are retired or have a license out of state, please encourage them to come and um, volunteer with us. Um, the reason we ask for the license, even though they are not going to do therapy like they do um, usually in their regular work, it's because we want to have this high bar so we know that we have that competency, we have those skills and the knowledge to assist those um, in the shelter. So how are individuals affected by disasters? As I talked about earlier, many people are resilient and will naturally return back to where their level of functioning was. Um, and if this means that they're gonna be able to return to take care of themselves, take care of their life as they might've been doing before the disaster. And this is really the most common outcome. Um, it, it, a lot of times, uh, and I get very up distressed when I hear people talking about how they've, the trauma and, um, and then focuses on the trauma, we're not focusing on the trauma. We're focusing on the resiliency and the coping skills. Um, but it is true that some people may experience some disorders uh, such as PTSD, depression, anxiety. Um, and we really look to see how they're coping down the road in terms of whether they might need some more professional help. Children we know have a big risk and we oftentimes focus a great deal on children but our focus is usually on the parents and helping the parents with skills of related to uh, what the child is going through and how they can best help the child. Um, although we might in the uh, shelter have things like uh, crayons and paper out for the children to, to work with. And because it always is a good way for children to um, talk to let us know about what they're going through because uh, as you know with a lot of children they really can't talk about their feelings or um, what all of this has meant to them. We're also aware that the responders are at risk which means of course those workers in the shelter and the shelter workers and at the end I'll talk about some of the the things that could that create problems and issues for the workers. So what do mental health workers do? Well, first of all, they provide some very some interventions which are approved. In other words, there are some interventions that we don't do. Um, you may have heard about critical incident stress debriefing or um, EMDR, those are some, uh, and uh, we don't do those for a number of good reasons. And the critical incident stress debriefing is something that fire and police do a lot of and like, um, and, and it probably fits for their um, culture and, they, and their, their work that they're doing. Um, so what are our interventions? There are, they are things like crisis intervention, psychoeducational. Um, we might in a, in a shelter 
uh, do a group with, uh, say, say we had a group of um, mothers with with children. One time we had um, some mothers who lived in the same apartment building, had never met, and the husbands were going off to work every morning, and they were left in the shelter. And so what we did is we had uh, some groups with them and the ability to talk with them then about how they can cope, any any issues that they had that they would like to discuss. Um, we might do advocacy. Advocacy could take uh, could be things like uh, advocating that uh, workers not have twelve hour shifts, that they have eight hour shifts. Doesn't always work. Um, and we also. Um, We'll advocate for, um, oh, if we, we feel like there's a need for um, more activities available in the shelter, different things like that that come to us that we learn as we wander around and talk with people in the shelter. Um, and work uh, and uh, the other one was uh, referrals as mentioned earlier uh, those folks who may need therapy ongoing we could we'll make a referral for that um, or we'll uh, we'll also help them get reconnected if that's needed um, and we do an enhanced psychological first aid is how we describe it we do psychological first aid but of course, remember, as I said earlier, our people are bringing their skills and knowledge and competencies with them. And so they can do those sort of enhanced psychological first aid, if that makes sense to you. Um, and one of the other things is to connect them back to their support system, uh, particularly a support system that's supportive and helpful. Um, we don't want to um, get them connected again if, if that's not a, a good relationship and one that that is not going to be helpful to them as they go through this. The, the idea of that support system and being connected with one is the most helpful thing that can happen to people, whether it's when we're doing our single family fires or our multifamily fires. Um, it's but one of the things we always want to look at is, do they have a support system? And is it a helpful one? Um, Red Cross workers, the disaster mental health workers, also in the shelter, are going to be talking with the uh, shelter staff. They're going to help them and um, discuss with them how to manage the stress within the disaster environment um, and and sometimes we'll do a consultation with Red Cross leadership about this in terms of some of the things that we're seeing in the shelter that are creating a great deal of stress. Uh, DMH or disaster mental health workers are available to assist in all types of responses, any kind of a response. In addition, we work not just in shelters, but anywhere with any site where there is um, uh, Red Cross workers. So that could be a warehouse. Um, the, when they're do, doing DES, uh, we might go out with the DES teams and um, or uh, follow them out into the community so that we can talk with the with the people in the community. Um, sometimes we have first aid stations get set up where um, we're up, out in the community available and, and going around the community. Um, we'll also be, uh, if there was a family assistance center um, and at headquarters as well, um, we'll be doing um, disaster mental health for the staff or what we would call staff mental health. We, we, when we're talking with people, we're real, we focus on their feelings, 
how they're feeling, um, their thoughts. As I said earlier, you know, some people begin to tell you they're 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 really having trouble concentrating. And behaviors uh, are they uh, doing things which are not helpful to them? Um, do we have people who are uh, disruptive? Uh, are they angry? Are they um, anxious? All of those things we're going to be uh, focusing on and, and watching for. So in terms of psychological first aid, and I hope all of you on this have taken psychological first aid. I know it's not required for all of the um, activities. In fact, I thought I saw that shelter worker SA did not need to take it, um, was not a, not a required. <laughs> um, but I would really, I would really, really uh, stress, uh, strongly recommend that you take it and that you take it if at all possible uh, virtually or in person. And, and I know that you can do it on edge, but the edge class is much, not nearly as long, nor as uh, give you as much information as you're going to get um, by taking the full class. So, um, the, one of the first action in Psych First Aid is to make a connection. Well, of course, how you're going to do that is you're going to greet the residents, you're going to give your name, and you're going to focus on the person. Um, you're you're going to be there and be very mindful of of them and listening to them, not try not trying to take in a conversation somewhere else or looking away from them. You really want to focus on them. Where we want people to be safe. Um, so in the shelter, you, you're going to want to, uh, you know, as you know, there's a, a walkthrough and a, disc and a look at any barriers. Um, are there cords on the floor? Are there wheelchairs? But you also want them to feel safe in terms of if you have people who are disruptive or who they they're very. Um, they're saying to you, you know, I'm, I'm really anxious about that person. I'm afraid of them, that kind of thing. Uh, and you want to help uh, get that help them to be feel safe and be safe. We're going to be kind, calm and compassionate. A lot of th times you'll see DMH and and same can happen from the shelter workers is we'll just hand them a bottle of water. We'll walk around with bottles of water and hand it out or blankets. Um, and we always remain calm and courteous and respectful, even if the people are being difficult. Um, and just remember, by the way, that if a client is angry at you and um, that that you are really an easy target. We are easy targets for the clients. They've got oftentimes they there's they're looking for someone to blame, and we will become that person. And we need to not take that personally, um, but realize why they're uh, targeting us. We. Uh, want to meet their basic needs. So the first, as you know, the first thing we do when we open a shelter is we get our cots ready, we get meals set up, we get snacks set up. Um, you know, there's uh, what often is referred to as Maslow's um, uh, hierarchy of needs. And um, the, the basic ones are a, a having a, a safe place, a place to sleep, and, and food and water. So we, we want to encourage them, of course, to rest, to take breaks, to go for a walk. Um, and the same, and while I'm talking about this, by the way, all of this applies to the workers as well. We want to make sure that they're taking their breaks, that they're going for walks. Um, and then we want to listen. Um, some of the uh, 
and a lot of times the uh, client residents may want to talk about what happened to them. And sometimes they may not want to, but sometimes they'll want to talk about it and they'll talk about it over and over again or to whoever will listen. Um, we certainly, we do listen to them. We listen carefully and attentively. Uh, and, uh, and, and as needed, you may feel that uh, in listening to them, that it might be helpful if they talk with a mental health worker. I would suggest that when you're going to make a referral, that you say to them, you know, we have counselors over here and perhaps maybe you'd like to talk to a counselor about that, or let me have you talk to this person over here and get them connected. Um, there is some thought that if they get too emotional while they're telling their story and they're telling it over and over again and they're getting very, very emotional and shaking and that kind of thing, that that's not good for them. And those are the folks that for sure you want to make sure mental health talks with. Um, giving real realistic assurance. As you all know, we're not going to say things like, well, Everything is going to be all right. Don't worry. Everything will be all right. Um, we just what we will do is let them know that this is very understandable and and this is um, very normal given the circumstances uh, for them to have these um, feelings or these um, uh, reactions that they're, that they're having to the event. So the next uh, one is encouraging good coping. We want to make sure that um, they're coping positively and not negatively. In other words, um, if people are are abusing alcohol or drugs, they are probably they may well be in a coping in a negative way. Um, they may become abusive, again, very negative. Um, and or you, you can have people sometimes who are really stuck and can't seem to get themselves moving to begin their recovery. Um, and, and again, that might be a time that you would want to make uh, with uh, referrals for uh, to uh, disaster mental health. We want to help them connect. I talked about the issue about how important it was to be connected with a support system. Um, sometimes that needs to take the case of some way of get, getting them access to a phone or having email available in the shelter. Um, the, and helping them make those connections. And, and of course, as you know, there's uh, Safe and Well, which uh, is often available to them to try to get reconnected with family or friends if they've gotten um, lost from them and separated from them during this event. So as I said, it's really important for the recovery to have that positive support. And the same is true for the workers. They need to stay in touch with their support system, uh, whether it's texting, email, phones, phoning, Zoom, et cetera. Um, when I first started in the Red Cross in 1999, um, uh, they used to give us phone cards uh, with a certain amount on the phone card as a way to be able to stay in touch with our families. Um, so that's always been an important thing that we've paid attention to. And of course, we want to give them accurate and and timely information. You know, people are going to be asking questions about, do you know whether the fire has moved here? Do you know what's happening? Do you know anything about the homes? And for that reason, a lot of times, um, will arrange for fire to come into the shelter and give information. And um, 
will uh, GMH will also as we be, if we begin to hear rumors and uh, things going on and we're hearing it from several of the residents, we're going to try to ground those rumors as quick as we can because we don't want to increase the stress and we don't want them to have misinformation. And this and for workers, we usually say to them, you know, what you should do is um, suggest if the person's asking questions and that um, is direct them to where they can get the answers. And sometimes there may be maps on the wall or it may be that there's something there's going to be a meeting at a certain time and making sure they know all those where they're going to be able to get that information. And I, I've said several times um, about making referrals to um, mental health. And I, what I would say is that if make a referral, no matter if your if your gut is saying, I think I should make a referral, make the referral. There's no nobody. Uh, DMH is not going to come back to you and and say to you, why did you refer that person to me? Um, we really um, want to make sure that nobody is getting lost in the um, chaos and the confusion that can sometimes be happening in the shelter. So don't uh, feel uh, that you have to be careful about who you're re referring. Um, The uh, next one is ending the conversation. Uh, you know, sometimes you may be talking with a person and you really need to go um, do some task that you're supposed to be doing. You need to set up the lunch or um, you need to go talk to one of the other workers. Um, you'll want to very politely excuse yourself and let them know if it's, if it's needed that you'll get back to them later. Um, or just ask them, is there anything else I can assist you with? And then and then move on. Uh, and finally, you want to take care of yourself. So you want to model your behaviors for your peers and your staff. And um, if you're a super, if you want to make sure you could use the PFA model um, and 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 one model thing is like uh, how you interact with the clients using PFA that you're taking your breaks that you're taking your days off and encouraging your peers to do that and making sure that everyone's taken care of. And by the way, when you're making referrals to DMH, also feel free if you have a if you're if you have a peer or fellow worker who you're really concerned about, you may want to go and ask the DMH to go and have a chat with them conversation. When we have conversations, they're always done very confidentially. Um, and sometimes uh, what we'll do if there's not if there's not space in the shelter where we can have a, a confidential uh, conversation, what we'll do is we'll go for a walk. Go out somewhere. Um, so what is the role of DMH in the shelters? Well, our role is there to to support mass care. And to do that, it requires co collaboration and some constant contact between um, the shelter managers and and the workers, the, the DMH workers, and at headquarters between the sheltering lead and the DMH lead. And they should be spending time talking about um, staffing numbers. Um, the the shelter manager may feel like um, I think that we we really need more DMH here because of the population we have, and 
and that needs to be negotiated then and discussed with DMH. Um, the other one that often comes up is the issue of shifts and the, in particular an over the overnight shifts. And so there are times when the shelter managers are feeling quite comfortable with not having DMH on site overnight. And as long as they have a 24 hour number of who they can call. And there are other times when um, they feel very much the need to have DMH present in the shelter, uh, given the population. So those are the kinds of things that um, would be worked out between the uh, the shelter manager and the DMH, the DMH lead. Um, and of course, if we were in the district model, as uh, some of you may have uh, had that experience. Uh, this would happen at the at the district level, um, and then the other is making sure that um, the D DMH needs to make sure that they're notifying the shelter lead or the sh shelter manager as to who's going to be working the next day, who they're going to expect to be showing up there, and some of that is done on the IP on the two hundred four form. Um, sometimes it just has a note that says to DMH. It doesn't give names. Um, so those are that that communication is so important between uh, the the shelter uh, workers uh, or the leads and the DMH. And and so as you can see, we really need to collaborate and work together. Um, on these administrative tasks, as well as collaborating and working together uh, in the shelter. And, and know that in terms of shelters, we're also, of course, supporting the, whoever's doing the feeding. Um, we sometimes make it quite involved with reunification um, and, and be working and, and assisting them. It's really important, and and this I I can't tell you where I found this, but I know I saw it. <laughs> there needs to be at least one DMH worker in each shelter within the first four hours. And uh, I think Diane talked a little yesterday about how sometimes IDC, which includes DMH and DHS, does not get included in that beginning phase of disasters uh, and, and sheltering. And people are thinking of, I gotta get a shelter up and running and forget about uh, making sure that DMH has been notified and that they're working on getting someone to the shelter. And, in, and there needs to really be a DMH person always in at least one in every shelter. Um, or you, you will sometimes see that we'll have the DMH people uh, itinerating, going from one shelter to the next. There are some um, guidelines around sort of a number of, of workers per uh, number of residents in the shelter. I think that uh, sometimes it's more a matter, again, of what are the needs in the shelter and what's your population. Um, and one of the things that the the DMH person who is first on this scene and 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 there and within that first um, four hours will be doing is in particular will be getting some situational awareness. What are the unmet needs here? Um, do we have a, a large population that got uh, evacuated out of a say a senior facility? So we have a lot of seniors. Um, um, is there a lot of anxiety because of whatever happened? I mean, all, or is there a lot of anger going on? So that situational awareness will really help the DMH lead to, again, to look at the numbers of DMH workers that we really should try to get into the shelter and the needs that we're going to have. They also, so, and they'll be available, of course, while they're there, 
um, for any immediate emotional needs. These the first person on the scene, the first DMH. And they can also help you uh, and assist you with if you have, say, distraught clients at registration, they're having difficulties filling out their registration. Um, there used to be a time when if there was a lineup for registration, they'd send the DMH out to work the line. I don't think that we do that as much anymore. We're usually a little more efficient with registration and have other ways to deal with it rather than having people standing in a line. They can also, of course, assist with setting up the shelter. One of the bywords in DMH is you do what needs to be done. So they should be willing to help out, to set up costs, um, and or stand in, in the line and, and give out food. This is, this for a DMH worker is an opportunity to interact with the clients often. And then they can uh, assess the needs and they can also um, help with any uh, unmet needs. So a DMH worker who's going to be working in a shelter, the first thing they do when they we tell them to do when they get to the shelter is to sign in and, co and connect with that shelter manager or shelter lead. They need to get a situational awareness and the shelter uh, manager needs to know who they are and, and uh, where they're going to be. For your information, uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that when a DMH is working in the shelter, they report to that shelter manager. Now, if we had a team of, say, five or six DMH, and that included a DMH SV, then those uh, worker, uh, other workers would report to the DMH SV, and the SV would report to the shelter manager. So that's something that a lot of times people don't seem to realize uh, that that's happening. Um, they'll, th the supervision then of those of that DMH in the shelter is one of administrative. If they need technical help, they will get that from their DMH lead at headquarters. Um, so for example, if they're uh, wanting to know um, about um, whether it's okay to use a certain intervention or how to how to handle a certain client and they're, they're they just can't seem to find a way to that's working. Those are the things that they'll talk to their supervisor at headquarters about. Um, the uh, administrative supervision will be all of the things that are happening in the shelter that uh, that they need to be part of the team. Um, they're going to uh, introduce themselves to the shelter staff and be visible. Now, sometimes what they'll do, um, DMH, is they might, um, because it, it's going to be hard to read their their um, name tags, especially if they have something that's just hanging in front of them and can be twisted and you can't see their name or what their activity is. Sometimes what they do is they put a star on or a flower or something to make themselves visible. Uh, or they'll, of course, if depending on how big a shelter it is, they can introduce themselves to the shelter staff so they know who they are. When they go to sign out, the DMH will again connect with the shelter manager and relay to the shelter manager any concerns they have or things that are going well in the shelter. The DMH workers will be mingling with the clients in the shelter. They will not be sitting at a desk and they won't be sitting at a table with a sign that says um, uh, disaster mental health. They're proactive. They go out they mingle with the clients, they chat with the clients, and they do the same thing with the um, uh, with the shelter staff. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, um, and, and then they'll um, re respond to referrals that they get 
from the shelter staff or from IDC because they're going to also work very closely with health services and spiritual care and uh, disability integration if they're in the shelter. Um, so as I said earlier, they do what needs to be done. And, and um, a lot of times at DMH, we see ourselves as the eyes and ears of the shelter that will oftentimes, because we're mingling, because we're going around and talking with people, we, we, we learn about things that are happening or what's going on or where some of the issues might be or the unmet needs, that, that there's no other place that people can really um, take those to or, or per people or, or what to do with them. And so a lot of times that we, um, we see that total picture and we'll, we'll talk about that um, uh, uh, with the uh, shelter managers or the shelter lead. So as I said, we do what needs to be done. Um, they ask you to go to the airport and get a car, you go to the airport and get the car. Um, um, in terms of referrals, I said earlier, if if your gut tells you, you, you really think that this person might benefit from talking, go ahead and make that. Um, there is a referral card that's part of Psych First Aid. It looks at risk factors and when you should make an immediate referral to DMH. In other words, you know, go over and, and grab them and say, I need you to go talk to so-and-so over there. Um, and there are some that can wait. And particularly if you're gonna have a shift change, um, you know, you know that that, will, that that person can wait until then. Um, and I, I wrote down here, if possible, uh, before calling 911 to talk with DMH. Of course, I'm aware that there are times when calling 911 is an emergency and has to be done immediately. But uh, just if there, if there, if it's possible and you don't need to do it immediately, get that DMH worker involved and and ta have talk with them. Um, you don't want um, police or fire coming out to the shelter um, and having a big um, to do over it when it's uh, with, uh, with on something that um, with a lot of work from DMH or um, could could have been avoided. Um, as I said, you can make um, verbal uh, referrals um, and, and and as I said earlier, it can be a worker as well as the clients. And it's also helpful a lot of times to have a process for referrals uh, when DMH is not present, uh, some confidential place where those referrals can be put um, so that when the next shift comes in or or that or if there's no night uh, overnight shift, the morning folks can will have it if it's a different group of people because that often happens. And by the way, I think the other thing you're going to see a lot more of in the in the shelters um, this year are a lot more of event based volunteers or the local regional volunteers or and people who may not or DMH who may not have had a lot of experience working in shelters. Um, so in terms of the DMH and the shelter staff working together. Um, we really like for the DMH to be and the shelter workers to see the DMH as a team member, as part of that team in the shelter. We both have the same mission. We both want to meet the needs of the clients. So it's really helpful to have the DMH people attend shelter meetings. They can in the shelter meetings they could present on um, on um, uh, uh, self care or coping skills, or they might give some tips on how to handle certain kinds of problems or issues in the shelter, um, and and they can and give they can give input on those issues, and they can give some suggestions, but also it gives the DMH and the time and the ability to hear from the shelter staff about what their concerns are 
and uh, what are some of their unmet needs. Um, so one of the uh, 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 shelter workers in my region said to me the other day that she was going to be doing a class on sheltering. Um, I'm not clear. Oh, on, on, I think it was on shelter supervisor. And she said her line is that DMH is your very best friend. That you don't have to solve all the issues yourself. You talk with DMH. Sometimes she said shelter workers tend to think that they've got to solve everything. They've got to meet the need, all the needs of the clients and they they don't uh, realize that the DMH are there and can help them and take some of that burden for them. So she said, just make sure they know and understand that DMH is your very best friend. So I, I, I think that <laughs> when I thought about this and the fact that I have the factors that affect shelter workers at the end, after we've talked about the clients, in some ways, I think we should have been talking about the shelter workers first and, and more and less about the clients, because I really think that, uh, as you all probably have heard, that, you know, if you're not, if you're not rested, if you're not in a good place, uh, if, and you're you're not going to be able to help the clients so uh and and there's a lot that we could talk about in terms of of shelter workers and and what happens with them but i wanted to just um highlight a couple of things one of them is that it can be very hard for shelter workers to hear the stories over and over again and the horror stories and people will be telling you about how they escaped and what it was like once they uh, escaped or um, they be, may be uh, you know over and over again telling you how angry they are um, how how anxious they are all of those things that can be very difficult um, the other is of course is that you're going to you may well be working in an unfamiliar area um, even within your region or your territory, um, you may be uh, maybe some part of the territory or the region that you've never been to before or a building you've never really been in before. Um, and you're going to be working. You may well be working with a lot of people who you don't know. Um, of course, since COVID, there are a lot of people who we haven't seen face to face for a couple of years. And uh, that's going to be a new experience to get reconnected with these people. Um, sometimes it's very hard to get rest, um, particularly uh, if we have a staff shelter. Now they have said that this year they would like to, and they're working towards hopefully uh, everybody could have a hotel room, a single hotel room. We'll see how that plays out depending on the uh, um, DRs, the, the responses that we have. But it can be difficult, even if you're in a hotel room, to get the rest that you need. Um, sometimes, oops, sorry. Um, sometimes um, if you're working those long hours and um, and it's very stressful, uh, the, long, the long hours and being, on your toes and available to the clients. It's an ever-changing environment in a shelter. Um, there's There may be people coming and going. There may be new um, doctrine or new rules about what's to happen, um, or, or you have to change shelters. All kinds of things can happen. It's and you know we often say that the three things that are important are flexibility 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 and right now i think we're having to live with a lot of am ambiguity um the one i've been hearing the past couple of days has to do with pets and shelters and um as you know um we're no longer going to be saying that we cannot have pets and shelters but 
what does it look like in terms of putting having pets in the shelters and what's that going to be all about and we don't have any doctrine or guidance on that right now specifically so those are the that those are things that can make like your job more stressful so please take care of yourself please utilize dmh um you another thing to have with dmh um and the meetings and stuff is to have them um maybe talk in a meeting about some stress uh, reduction ways um some breathing exercises um all sorts of things like that that can help to uh alleviate some of this stress hopefully 